I think we're going to start a, a new a new aspect of Nativ, and that is interviewing interesting people. Uh, you're like you're Jim. You're my first test candidate, so you're like the most interesting man in the room right now. So uh, we're going to give you the props, all that in just a moment. But I want to talk about the world of uh, of that we're living in. Uh, the the aspect of people of the nations that are coming to the knowledge of God, and what is a Noahide, and what how why was it defined the way it is? I mean, we'll kind of get into some nuances and the criticisms that come from individuals, but also uh, the fact that it is a well established concept that the people of the nations have always attached themselves at some point, even all the way back to Abraham to the Jewish people. And they've been a vibrant community of people that have always been attached. It's not been a humongous number, but I think the one reason why is this. We have a society that has such a propensity for idolatry that it's almost impossible to give them the purest level of connection with Hashem because they want to make a religion out of it. And we're going to we're going to talk about all those aspects, but first I want to introduce you to Jim Long. Jim Long has been uh around the Noahide world, let's say, Noahide community, uh, for uh, roughly 30 years now. And he's a writer. He is a producer. He he is a, what do you call it, a, a, a movie producer. And he's written, written scripts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, very involved in the Noahide world. Jim, tell us a little bit about where you came from and how you got here. Okay. Well, Rod, thanks for having me on, by the way. I yeah. appreciate that very much. And uh, I hope I hope after your first test case with interesting people, it, it doesn't go awry. Hopefully so, not. <laughs> right. So anyway, I, maybe some of your listeners already, uh, I, I may even know some of them already. The My first introduction to the actual idea, actually my, my first introdu- introduction to Torah was through a gentleman that you uh, know very well, the late Vendel Jones of blessed memory. Yes. He was a he was a, a colorful uh, kind of a renegade archaeologist, and he basically they they literally broke the mold when mm-hmm. when Vendel was made. And he grew up in West Texas. His um, he you know people often ask me they said how did this this as we say in Texas this hair legged country boy. How did he get into such a position of uh, not let alone teaching Torah, but being being so interested in Israel, right. ancient and modern, and just the Jewish people in in a, a part of the country back in the th- he was born in 1930. His his mm-hmm. dad was a, a a barber. His mom worked there, and the he told me the story when once uh, it was World War II, and um, or he was gearing up. And and um, his uh, his mother worked at the barber shop too. She she kept the uh, mirrors clean and did you know it was mm-hmm. a mom and pop operation literally small town in West Texas. The um, the banker was reading the newspaper. You know all the townspeople would gather and they're reading the newspaper one day and a big cigar in the guy's mouth. And uh, he's re- reading the paper and he looks around the, the full barber shop that morning and he says, "Well, boys." Looks like the old Hitler is going to take care of the Jews for us. Oh. And Vendel's mother grabbed the scissors off next to the clippers and went over and she poked him in the stomach. And she said, you get out of here and don't come into this barbershop again if you're going to talk about the Jews like that. I don't want to see you again. Get out of here. And she chased him out of the barbershop with a pair of scissors. And uh, Vindel's dad said, you know, sweetheart, you know, we have money in that bank. She said, there's, <laughs> an, there's another bank just a few miles away. It'll, right. be, it'll work just as good there. And as Vindel often used to tell people, when he was, when he was uh, in, in the womb, when, it, when his mother found out that she was pregnant, she, according to the family lore, she rolled up a newspaper in a, the shape of a megaphone, a coil, and she would read the Bible and and read it towards her stomach, carrying Vendel. 
And by the way, when he was growing up, she never read anything but what you and I and our most of our audience call the Tanakh. She didn't have a Tanakh, so to speak, but she had a she had a Christian Bible, but she never read the the New Testament. She only read the so-called Old Testament to Vendel. So he was already exposed to this idea that of God's chosen people. And and uh, one of the things that he uh, used to talk about was watching the newsreels. And and when they finally, near the end of the war, when they finally uh, released the, the, the Jewish prisoners from Dachau and the other uh, concentration camps, and they had the captured German footage. And he remembers watching it in the theater and weeping and wondering how people could treat the Jews that way. So this is the man I met uh, in Dallas, Texas in 1993, when I was still in radio. I was in broadcast radio. I had been for about 35 years. And he was a last minute replacement. It was it was from heaven. He, we, we weren't even supposed to have him on that morning. And we had a guest cancel. And through Anyway, I finally, I'd heard of Bendel, booked him. I, I, we, he, the, the guest book uh, actually uh, canceled the day before. Mm -hmm. It was literally a last minute booking. I'd never met him. I'd only heard of him. So, and, and now in my life, when I meet Bendel, when he comes to the radio station, we have him on. We were supposed to have him on for one hour, but all five of our call-in lines to ask were questions. We're full the whole time. They were lit up the whole time. We couldn't even get to all the all the questions. So we kept him on for an extra hour, still couldn't get to all the questions. I was blown away by the man. I, I were, I, you know, Rod, I didn't know Torah. I knew mm -hmm. of the Torah, but I didn't know a lot. I, I was like a lot of Christians, even today, that think they know things about the Torah. And, and people don't, and we know this sadly, they don't know a lot. They may no, know. No, no. If they're, if they're studying with a rabbi, you know, maybe. Right. So I... Anyway, basically, and, and, and the funny thing is, I was in a I, I was in a religious cult before, for about four years, and and I was a big time Christian, and I grew up a Catholic, and I jettisoned that when I was in the eighth grade. I just thought it was, I was I didn't want anything to do with, uh, in, you know, in deference to our, you know, any Catholic listeners, right. I I just didn't see it, and what really turned me away from it was finding about finding out about the uh, the Spanish Inquisition. And I wondered why it was never taught when I was in Catholic school. And of course, now I see it, it was a, an obvious uh, yeah, reason. It was, it was counterproductive. It was counterproductive. <laughs> and because the nuns would hold forth all the time in the middle of a, of a arithmetic, you know, a math uh, class, our nuns would go off the, the derrick and start talking about the saints. The saints, you know, because they're all Irish. Oh, they're all the Irish saints, of they course. Were the, Sister Mary, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Mary, so like, Mother, and Joseph. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, it's Mary. And um, it's, it's just a story I, I, I tell. It's a true story. I was so into being this Catholic kid I, I, that I bought into everything so much that in, in the second grade, the school I went to in South, in, in uh, Coastal Bend City of, of Corpus Christi, um, they the the teacher the nun gave me a note and she said Jimmy would you take this to the mother superior because the convent was there on the grounds of the school oh, okay and I remember going into the convent this is where they slept this is where right. they ate their meals and everything and I was scared to death and I went in and I mother superior's office was at the end of the hall I was told so I walked towards the end of the hall and I remember vividly. Uh, I was walking this through this quiet convent past these beds, and I heard this strange noise, this gurgling sound. And I wondered what it was. I, my curiosity got the best of me. And I went over to see what it was, and I opened the door, and it was a bathroom. It was a what? A bathroom. It was their toilet. And I, I, I went back to my, my good buddy, at recess, and I said, you know what I saw in the convent today? I saw a bathroom. He said, no. I said, yes, they go to the bathroom. <laughs> you and, thought that I mean, they were how, so saintly they didn't have to use they, you know, the restroom. <laughs> and and um, so, I, I mean, I, I mean he, he didn't even believe it. 
So, I mean, that's how much into this. Yeah, right. mindset so, so basically, like Jim Gaffigan would say about his wife, you were like the Taliban of the Catholics. You were like the <laughs> serious Taliban Catholic. Right. I, I don't so, mean I'm not disparaging the Catholics. of course. Yeah. But, yeah. The Taliban can go. Well, anyway, so <laughs> yeah. basically, this is the background I came from. I was in I was in a fundamentalist religious cult for a while. I got I got sucked into it because I because they were they claimed to be in, into archaeology. And I, I've always loved archaeology, mm -hmm. uh, especially biblical archaeology. And so um, they, we were doing lectures. We were going around. the. We were doing lectures. And basically, somebody, these guys had claimed that they'd seen the Ark of the Covenant, this cult I was in. That's another story. Okay. But anyway, some guy asked a question. He said, are you guys working with, with Vindal Jones? And I'd never heard of this guy before. Mm -hmm. and, the, and our our leader just went white and said, we, we don't have anything to do with that guy. Uh, and of course, he was because he knew Vendel's views on, you know, he knew that Vendel was pulling people out of various belief systems. Right, right. You know, voluntarily, by the way. Right. And so I was I'd heard of him. So when someone told in Dallas that he lived in in Arlington, which is between Dallas and Fort Worth. So anyway, I after I had him on the show and I heard these amazing things. And by the way, Rod, I didn't know I was hearing Torah. Right. But I was. Right. And in, in between, because Vindel could never talk about his work uh -huh. without Torah coming out. Right. So I, I said, you know, I, I asked him, uh, if, do you have to go right back after the broadcast? And bought him a cup of coffee in, in the restaurant downstairs. Kept him there for another two hours. Wow. I was like a little bird. And he invited me out to his Torah class. And that was my beginning to learn Torah at the, at the foot, so to speak, of, of Vendel Jones. That I, we, we had visiting rabbis that would come in and talk. Right. And, 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 I, and I saw the way that they held Vendel in such esteem. I thought, he must be doing something right. Right. And eventually, in 94, I got to go on my first archaeological dig with him. I was there three months, almost converted. And he said, hold on. He said, now, I'm not telling you not to, but... You know, there. You know, uh, you've heard about the Sheva Mitzvot. And he said, right. you know, you can have a relationship right. with the Creator without taking on the six thirteen. And uh, so, anyway, I, I stayed my decision. And then I got married the next year. We got married in Israel. Carol and I got married on the dig mm -hmm. the next year. She arrived on a camel. I'm not making that up. And we had a. Uh, we had a Noahide wedding, and every Noahide wedding I've ever been to or have officiated at, they're all different. Yeah, and you've actually done a couple for me, I believe. I did. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. In fact, I have. We have. We're very close friends with with uh, right, Tar with, and Nancy. Ta Tar and Nancy, they're great people. Yeah, and uh, they live up in Kansas. So anyway, um, so you well then you also know this. You know that they're all different. Ours we had. We were in a we were at the cave of the column by the Dead Sea, so we had seven torches around mm -hmm. the site for the Shevamitz vote, right? And we had a chupa, and uh, a lot of our a lot of our friends who get married uh, as Noahides actually will have a chupa. You don't right. have to. There's no halakha, but right. but uh, often we have friends that uh, are even married by a rabbi. And, well, I, uh, I have an important question to ask you. Yeah, sure. Uh, you had mentioned how religious you are. I, you were. I mean, you know. Yeah. You loved your Catholicism. You loved your whatever group that right. you were in 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 Northwest Texas. But how does a guy who is really jazzed up about religious concepts all of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, but over time, yeah, have progressed to a guy that really doesn't look at Noahide? lifestyle it's not a religion so no. you've actually adopted a non-religious relationship with god and that almost seems to be counterintuitive doesn't it it does it does so yes, talk yes. to me a little bit about you understanding that and what that has done for you in your life yeah well first of all when i when I was introduced to the concept, when I was when I began to study Torah with Vendel and, and the others in his classes, and then later, I actually you, he actually asked me to help him. Mm -hmm. and I would I would teach if he had to go out of town. Often I went out of town with him because I was I was also his driver. Right. And and we would and you remember you remember uh, slide, uh, 
I can't even oh, think of the no, name no anymore. slide projector? Yeah. yeah, slide projectors. I would, yeah. I would, you know, work all that. Well, you're lecture. aging yourself big time, Jim. Hey. So anyway, so I was, you know, uh, chief cook and bottle water, the whole thing. And, and, and then he later would let me actually be his opening act. Okay. When I got when I when I wrote my book on the Exodus and I was right. I began to lecture on it, but anyway, to to back to your question, uh, I really was I, I, you know I I often tell people when we talk about you know how we 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 got on this path in the first place what interested us. My mother is the reason I believed in God, and mm -hmm. and she was not anything. She was uh, if anything the family that she grew up in. She grew up in. in Southeast Missouri, big family, very poor. And uh, she actually enrolled my brother and I in Catholic school because she wanted us to get religion. Right. And so even though she she wasn't a Catholic. So I was, because of what I just described, I was into this sort of weird aspect of, of uh, belief in, in, in the Creator. And so... But I remember even even as an eight year old kid, and and this is one of those memories that somehow, even though it was, I was eight years old, I still recall the day, laying out under a tree on a beautiful summer day, in a park, and looking up at this cloudy, uh, uh, uncloudy sky, blue, vivid blue sky, just a, a few clouds. And I remember thinking about God all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and it occurred to me, God is bigger than this sky. And the sky looked really big to me that day. Mm -hmm. Right. And I remember being overwhelmed by that thought. And so I, from that point on, I remember always looking for what is it, what does God really want from us? Right. When I was a Catholic, I thought it's got to be more than just, you know, so, you know, whipping yourself, you know. Right. But you but know, the, the point would be is you went, well, as a, as a to your mother sent you as a yeah. child to a Catholic school. Yeah. Uh, because that's where you look. You look, if you want to find God, you go to a place where there's religion that yeah. talks about God. Right. But the irony of the whole thing is you went from Catholic to cult involvement to now a man who embraces um concepts that are not even really accepted much even in the regular world because religious people look at Noahides like, ah, yeah. you, you know, you don't want to do the, the 613, you just want to do seven. Okay, mm -hmm. we get it. Yeah. Or this is just a made-up thing afterthought. The Jews just made this up for all the non-Jews that are coming around since the last, what, 30 or 40 years. Yeah. And that's not the case at all. I mean, no. Noahides have been around since the time, actually since Abraham. They weren't called Noahides. They've never been called Noahides. Is a postmodern, uh, yeah. what do you call it, uh, yeah. description. Yeah, they were when 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 people began to take note of them in in uh, when the Jews began to disperse around the world. They were they were called, especially in the Roman Empire. They were called God fearers. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the uh, I don't know if you want to look at this. I want to show you this or not, but we can look at it in a, a minute or two. I want to come back to the idea of the God fearers, right? And right, how, right. How they are, for all intents and purposes, actually Noahides. Uh, but anyway, the, the the jump I made from this this sort of mystical, you know, realm of, you know, believing what I thought was holiness. I, right, I didn't right, right, I right. didn't understand the word, um, but I it was a, a process that. But I was uh, I, I was a Methodist for a while. I was Church of Christ for a while. I got into this cult, and the cult actually was the first time I met Christians who did not believe, this is amazing, they did not believe that uh, J.C. was God. Interesting. And, and they celebrated Shabbat. Interesting. But, but they believed, but they were Christians, though. Right. And they, they were the first ones that mentioned the word Torah to me. But when I began to study it in earnest with, with Vendel and study on my own and met rabbis, uh, for the first time, one of the first things that, that occurred to me that I saw and really appealed to me, Rod, was how down to earth the teachings were. Right. How the how in the in the whole of the Tanakh, you, it's rare to find the history of a people and a culture where they tell you everything, warts and all. That's right. You, you hear about yeah. the bad kings and how bad they were. 
you hear about the, you know, and and then even look at this week's Parsha. Mm -hmm. Look at look at. Um, I know when people will be watching this, but while we're recording this, I've, I've been looking at uh, at Parsha. Um, I've suddenly we did Ikev show 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 team show team. Now we're on. Um, uh, I've suddenly gone blank, and I've been studying it. Hello, old Hello. man. Ha happens to us all. Um, um, Ketetzi. Ketetzi. Yeah. I, I, that's my yeah. broken. Ketetzi. 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 Yeah. Ketetzi. But we're, it's all, one of the things, it's all, it's like 70 uh, of the 613. And almost all of them seem to be completely not even, they, they seem not to have anything to do with the other. And yet mm -hmm. they do. They right. do. And one of the things that, one of the most surprising things that I read in the Torah in fact, th this uh, Torah Parsha was one of those things that made me see that it's all, this is the journey, is that Torah is given to to humanity, and the Torah is here on the earth, right? and it's all about living day to day, mm -hmm. and not just, not a, what we used to call a Sunday go to meeting existence, it's every day, and it deals with the most, what we would often consider the most mundane things. In this week's Parsha, the the uh, laws about going for the 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 Jewish army going to war mm -hmm. is is uh, they 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 pack a, a shovel, yeah, and they use a shovel to when they're at war to dig a hole after they've done their business, right, to bury you know? it, right, and and it's these kind of things that that it did not take away the sanctity of the Torah for me, because I think it I believe like all of us that probably watch this show that that the, the the you know the torah is sanctity you know right the torah is and and there is an idea of holiness but holiness is not this like weird you know like you know cue the theremin music and you know weirdness right, and all right, that right and not it's not it's not what i call blue smoke and cherubs right it's yeah. it's a very and and then here's another thing and, and this i gradually embraced it because it's a life because the torah is you rarely, you know, uh, you have to look for the place, the specific places in the Torah that speak of the afterlife, mm -hmm. because it's not, it's 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 from we get it from the oral tradition, right. but it's not it's not stated concretely there, because the Torah is all about living every day, right? And 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 that that helped me along the way, and then Vindel, of course, he would tell I would his his words ring in my ear. When people would 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 sort of come at him with that kind of thing, he'd say, "I don't let uh, my spirituality. I don't let it. Uh, I don't let religion get in the way of my spirituality." Right, right. And so, and then the other thing that really I think that really it really made it set in stone for me was uh, it, it occurred to me, and I and I hope everybody that occurs to them, I'm reading. Uh, in Bray Sheet in, in, in uh, Genesis. And uh, Hashem tells Avram Avinu, Abraham, he says, I will make of you a great nation. Mm -hmm. And he never uses the word religion. Right. I'm going to, and when they're at Sinai, he says, I will make you a, a nation of priests. And it's really, and, and this is when, this is when I realized that first of all, that not all of the Torah I, I'm going to quote Vindel again. I'll pivot a little bit. Of course. Vindel used to say that the Torah is is not written to me, but it's written for me. Right. And that's that's exactly my point is that is that unless you're a Jew, you don't have to keep the 613. Right. It isn't. It's the laws that apply to what I consider the Jewish person it would be like the laws of the United States do not apply to someone that lives in China. Thank you. Uh, it just does it. Now, are there universal laws that we both follow? Absolutely, 100%. And that's what Judaism has been attempting to share with people right. for a long time. But, yeah. you know, obviously the messenger gets shot yeah. often. Yeah. But the whole point is, is I really do believe that we're in a, a, in a, in a period right now that is ripe for individuals to connect, spiritually connect to God at the highest level, and to not be, uh, not have it set aside by religion. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying religion's bad, but it sure can get in the way of you yeah. knowing 
the creator. Now, I ask this fundamental question to everyone. I'll ask you, and you know the answer, but what was Abraham's religion? Was he a Jew? Well, he was a Noahide before he was a Jew. <laughs> right, exactly. What was, What about uh, Noah? Noah was a, was a Noahide. He was... Right. What about Enoch? What about Lamech? I mean, just go through the, all of these people. It mm -hmm. says that Enoch walked with God. What yeah. does that mean? God yeah. doesn't have legs. He had to know how to. He had to know how to. What was it? So it was it was about uh, a relationship with a higher being that causes me or creates within me an environment where I get to participate in creation on earth. Right. Daily participate. Yeah. And in discovering what that is. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're, we're the, the, the Torah is shot through with this concept that we are co-creators. I right. really, I really believe. I'm going to go on a limb here. I'm going to. I really believe that one of the um, ideas, because you know, you know, a Torah verse is is like a like a Windows program. You know, you you mm -hmm. hit the verse and it opens up right. the different windows and different. You know, it, it it's applicable to many things. On the negative, people used to say, "Well, you can make the Bible say anything you want to." Oh, no, I've heard that. Yeah. If you if you go, this is why we have the oral tradition is right. is to tell you. So that you won't get off course and 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 make up your own interpretation. Correct. That doesn't. But we are allowed to speculate if we want to. And I speculate. And maybe maybe a great rabbi has already said this. But I often wonder that when in Breshit, when when uh, Hashem says, "Let us make man in our image," I wonder if He isn't speaking to the souls that are going to come down into the earth. You know plan. what? I, that, I know that that might sound out there, but I have pondered that very same idea. Yeah. I, I, so. I, you know, I, yeah. I think it's a, look, we all know that we're created souls. We're put here in this earth suit mm -hmm. to, uh, to somehow bring down goodness to this low place of physicality. And right. these concepts have been well known amongst people all over the world uh, in other religions. Like they yeah. know of this concept, but right. what they don't see that you and I get an opportunity to see is that every human being has this ability to do it without joining a religion. Right. You know, I mean, look, people get yeah. church. You know, you'll hear churches say, preacher, get up. You know, that's... Yeah, you're going to find God, don't come to church. You know, you just find it at home, whatever, you know, God's not at church, whatever, whatever it may be. But the point is this, is if you're looking for the creator in religion, you're going to find some levels of him that he'll reveal to you, but it's going to be muddled by the religious dogma. Sure. And taking the Torah as it is pure, and to read the text and study the text and find out what it means and how it applies to our own personal life sets you free, sets you free from the con confines or construct of religious things that, that often go against those values. Right, right. Right. And, yeah. you know, it's interesting. My, my granddaughter, she's 16 and, or 15, I don't know, 16. And we went to go park. And we pulled into a parking space, and I said, no, let's not park here. Let's go down five more spaces. She said, why? We're right. We're right. We're right. The business is right down there. Mm -hmm. And I said, I understand, but we're parked in front of somebody else's business, and we're taking their spot. And even though there's no law against it, it's like theft. And she mm -hmm. was gobsmacked. Like, why would you be concerned about that? Because that's how the Torah forms you, yeah, yeah, and informs you. You you right. you start living a life that's not bound by oh, is this by the technical letter of the law? No, you you actually begin to it, it you embody it. It becomes part of who you are, and that's the beauty of it. Without needing a religion, we're not saying that if you're religious, that you know it's bad for you. But we're just no. saying open up your heart and realize that there is so much more available to you. Right, right. So the, much. The, more. the thing that the thing that I I know that marked uh, my that, that you know the thing that that um, sadly that that much of the other mainstream belief systems have is they they get the the uh, the cart before the horse. Yes, and that is that Hashem does not want you to 
check your brain at the door. Correct. When you, when you walk into the study hall or where you, wherever you walk into. And so the, the, that was another thing that appealed to me is the fact that, that, uh, you know, in fact, in, in Judaism, you know, scholars are revered. Oh, yeah. We, we both not that, you, you know, we often get up when, when a teacher comes in the room out of respect. And, and, and the what always I always remind people that, you know, when especially this comes around when, when whenever Purim rolls around mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, the 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 Jewish people in the Persian Empire were had gotten to a point where they were you know, be able to enjoy some religious freedom. By the way, right. you heard me say the word religious, because right. I, because I'm not afraid to say I'm not afraid to say a I don't believe in in a religion, but I also believe that there is it's an adjective, and that is it's a good way to say that Israel is a religious nation. Right. Know? So, but anyway, the point being is is that you know Mordechai was also a teacher, and he and and the point is is that when you read about the 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 history of, of the Jews in Persia, you know, they were bankers, they were teachers. Mm -hmm. And every time, every time a, uh, a Jewish community was set up anywhere in the world, one of the first things they did, and I know you know this, Ron, they had to set up a school. Right. And a study hall. Yep. A study hall. And, and this, even for the kids, they, they because, because the, um, and, and the reason I invoke the idea of Esther is because there's a I'm doing I'm always doing research in into you know the Exodus is my favorite you know uh, story right and it, we know it's not just a story but it's my one of my favorite narratives right in in the Torah and but another one in the Tanakh is the story of Esther and I have a script I wrote uh, called the Orphan Queen right so I'm always researching to see if I can find things to anchor what I hope will be a documentary that we release. At of the course. Same time yeah. That we release the, the, ep, the biblical epic I'd like to produce. Right. To really tell the story of Esther because they made five movies about, about Esther and they've ruined all five of them and they didn't leave the plot alone. <laughs> I haven't even bothered watching the last one. There's, there's not any of them worth watching yeah. by the way. They're laughable. But anyway, I, I, a little tidbit here is that, um, the woman that I believe now that we that I, I with the, her, the help of a researcher in Israel who's written a book about the Persian Empire, and I believe he's really nailed who Achashverosh was. Ah, okay. And um, he he happens to be a, a, one of the only Persian kings who's famous for killing his first wife. Interesting. He's, he's a guy called Gam Cambyses. Yeah, and, that would nail that down. <laughs> that that. He's also known for being wacky. Uh -huh. He's also known for the, his 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 Persian name because Achashverosh was a pun. Right. Which, the, the Jewish people made a pun. It's like a, a pain in the head. Right. Because he always changed his mind. They didn't know what he was going to do. So it's a pun on his title, mm -hmm. Artaxerxes. Which Interesting. Is what, the, what the Greeks oh, called yeah. him. But anyway, and the the and the Persians called him Artaxerxes. That was a title. So anyway, this guy. Everything fits the time period. Right. He, he killed his first. He put his first wife to death or something silly. He um um he he was he was nuts. Um and then his his next wife. This is in Persian history. Mm -hmm. His his next wife was a woman who was known for two things. She was known for her beauty. Mm -hmm. But she was all now. This is Persia. And you know the Persian people, the Persian royalty in that time, they were not really, even though they ran the country and they were royalty, they weren't really educated people. They'd come from the mountains. Mm -hmm. This is why you had Ahasuerus be, being read to at night by the scribes. It wasn't just because he was he wanted to get sleepy and get bored. Right. He, could, he probably couldn't read. And he had everybody read and write for him. But anyway, right. it says right. that she was beautiful. And something else unusual, Rod. She was very educated. Mm -hmm. That was unusual in that time for a woman to be educated. Uh, yeah, well, in the in, in the non-Jewish world, for sure. Yeah. So, so it, it, the point is, so we've got all these these b bullet points to say this might be this the right couple. Well, I think what finally nails it is the fact that you know he remarries a very educated, very beautiful woman, and her name, according to the Persian history, I'll spell it out loud for you. H A T 
T-O-S-S-A. That's how that's how they spelled her name. So really? How would you how would you pronounce that? H A T O S S A. Adasa? Adasa. Right. That's what they call it. Because you because Esther was something yeah. Yeah. It wasn't really what, what they they tell us it wasn't really they you know Ishtar they named her after the the Persian Venus or whatever. Oh, oh okay. So they probably called her that, but everybody in town knew. Hey, she's really this Jewish kid after right. the right. the whole story. That's a that's a kind of a, me getting off track to talk about the the importance of of education and all that. But I wanna I wanna come back to the the again the reasons that that the Torah brought me into this realm and why I decided to. To to uh, I would be I would follow the Shevamitz vote, and the reason I still study it is because you you can't read the Torah and not figure out pretty quickly that even though you know the reason that the, the Jewish people are given six hundred thirteen is they have to they have a higher calling right so they're required to live a much more mm -hmm. stringent life right why because many of the things that they do in their in their nation, uh, when they when they return, may it c come speedily. When they right. return to a Torah law, uh, it will become a model for how nations should live Correct. and work. And, and 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 the Jews become the the teachers of the nations. Exactly, and nobody's going to listen to them if they don't look at them and go and run after them and grab them by their seat seats and say, "Take us with you." Yep. Because we've heard God is with you. Well, right. how is that going to happen? Right now, Rod, we have we have a world that that you and I never believed we would see again. No. We have we have a world where I thought anti Semitism was a dying thing. I agree. I agree. And so I think that you'll agree with me too that October the seventh, the, the the world changed. Absolutely. And God said, All right. Uh, everybody out of the pool, right? Basically, it was a way of of Hashem, of, of of the Creator of time and space, God, drawing a line in the sand, and He's making it easy for you to either choose that you're going to stand with the Jewish people, right, or you're going to you're going to use lies and form it lies after. And, and we also there is a huge divide of. And very obvious on what side people are on now. If you're sure. on the side of goodness and purity and truth and integrity, that's one side. And then there's another side that's uh, off the rails, right. off the rails with confusion about their gender and about the abortion and this and that and this and that. You know, uh, it, it's unbelievable. But we have to get to that place so mm -hmm. people can make a choice. I think that free choice, uh, free choice is a very beautiful thing that God has given us. But my goodness, when people realize, and it's going to come, it's interesting that we're in in this era that we live in and now with technology and internet and scanning devices and all kinds of things that we can look at text and ancient text and go back and we're finding information about Israel in the United States, right? That far preceded anybody discovering the United States that we know of. You understand what I'm saying? It's like we're talking about 2,000 years ago, yeah. Hebrew writing on stones. I mean, when, when you realize it's much grander than you can even imagine. I had somebody give me an illustration that I love it. And uh, and now, now that I'm thinking about it, I can't remember, the, the huge, huge uh, mountain in Australia, the big red uh, Um. I think I know the one you're talking about. I can't. It, it, it looks like a. It's it's what geologists call an uplift. It's right. A, yeah. It's it's it's, it's huge. And, and look, I didn't realize that it was so massive. Like it, it is hundreds of feet tall and wide. And mm -hmm. when the clouds come over, it rains or, or the rain falls, and it supplies all the water around the foot footing. So the Aborigines considered that a holy site. It was like, you know. Right. The gods smiled on us or whatever they, they believed. But the point would be is it's much bigger than you can even conceive. And here's the problem. I've only seen it from pictures on Google. Yeah. This fellow drove out to it and he said, I was in awe at how massive this 
this revered piece of you know stone is yeah. and and yet I don't think that we really understand that what's coming down the pike is going to shake everybody. I I do believe that even the religious people will be shaken by the realities of the truth that is going to, to come out. Well, I, I think that uh, what we have to do is look at the prophets and look at what Chazal, the sages, tell us that that the, the end of days, uh, that the, the, the events of the Exodus will pale in comparison right. To the right. things that we're going to see. By the way, I, you know, while I have the time, I want to address something that is uh, something that I hear often. I've heard it ever since I, I began to, you know, uh, call myself, as I say, a card carrying nullified. Mm -hmm. And that is that, that uh, even scholars have, have written, uh, we, we've, we've had scholars write in defense of it, we've had scholars that scoffed at it. And the, the, the naysayers sometimes will say, well, you know, it's it's this idea that sort of must have propped up in modern times because we, you know. Oh, yeah. You're, you're talking about you call it the concept of of the, quote, Noahide or the God fear. Right. It's just a, it's a postmodern construct. And it's really, you know, that's never really existed. Right. But, but you have evidence. Other. other well, other the, the idea, the idea of, of non-Jews who embraced Torah and did not convert, uh, convert. Right. Um, and I think conversion is an unfortunate word, by the way. I think when a person does that, they literally are going through a what what here in this country we call a naturalization and immigration process. Uh, because... actually, actually, that is probably the best description mm -hmm. that we can give the non-Jewish world is that those who who be, decide to become Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. They're joining a nation. They are. Be and that's they're that's getting the, their dual citizenship right. per se. That and that's the reason that you can you can make Aliyah, right? Because right. you can't because they have the law of return in Israel, and the uh, you know a convert uh, basically you have become part of the ancient commonwealth of Israel. By the right. way, they wouldn't call the people who are not living in Eretz Israel if it's called if they're living outside. It's called you know the diaspora mm -hmm. or, or the galut. Uh, that must mean you're not in your nation, you're not in your Correct. land, because and that means you have you have the the label of a nation, right? And with your own set of laws, your own your your own uh, land, you have everything that that is textbook uh, guidelines mm -hmm. for what what requires a an actual country to exist, right? And the um, and I, if somebody I, wants to if somebody wants to join uh, the tribe, they they should. But one yeah. of the first things that I do when someone's asked and says, hey, I'm thinking of converting, uh, you know, what do you think? And I'll say, well, uh, why? And yeah. hear the explanation. And if it's merely uh, a discussion of religious practices, I'm just I usually will go, well, you're joining a nation. Yeah. You're already spiritual as you need to be. You're already as connected to the Holy One, blessed be He, as you need to be. Right. Becoming Jewish doesn't make you any closer to God. However, it does put you in the tribe. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, interestingly, every uh, I've, I've known several uh, Noahides who have uh, converted. Mm -hmm. I do, uh, too. Uh, I have a, a, there's a couple, one couple that I... Uh, have known them since since he was an 18 year old kid coming to Vendel's classes, mm -hmm. and now he and his wife and they have children and they live in they live in wow. a, a beautiful community called Pardes uh, Chana, and the um, it's interesting that every now I don't know about this but it it may be uh, anecdotal but I I know a lot of Noahides and the ones that I know that converted all convert Orthodox right now because yeah, they absolutely. believe. That to, to be to be, you know, uh, an observant Jew, uh, that they need to live in Israel, and and we right. have just got through reading. There, are, mm -hmm. I I think there I can't remember the there are over especially in the book of Devarim, there are I think around three hundred commandments mitzvot right. that that say when you enter the land, right when you you can't you cannot keep some of the mitzvot. yeah the the vast majority of the laws are laws that only apply in the land because it's right. the Laws of the land, right, and and so, but 
what I was going to, I, I, again, I you have to you have to catch me because I get off course often. But what I was going to mention is the idea that sometimes people think that they because they haven't heard of the seven laws, well, it, it just must be a modern construct of some kind. And yet you can track it through history. Oh yeah. And you can start, of course, you know, it's it's there in in uh, the, the concept has been handed down by the Jewish sages for centuries. One of our great ones, the Rambam, a.k.a. Maimonides, mm -hmm. wrote an entire tractate on it in his uh, in, in right. the tractate, the laws of the kings in the Mishnah Torah. Right. Um, uh, Josephus, the historian who is recognized by by most other historians mm -hmm. as a classic historian. He references uh, what what are not called Noahides; they're called God fearers. Correct. And I won't attempt. I won't. I won't attempt to say the word in 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 Greek. I'm, I'm, my Greek is a little shabby. And don't even ask me. I've I've been away from that for a long time. But anyway, there is. Uh, but one of the one of the uh, we have archaeological proof of these people called God fearers, and we find it in the in the the country of Turkey in North. Uh, actually, in central western, getting close to the Mediterranean, in right. western Turkey, in what used to be called Asia Minor, near uh, the ancient uh, area where where Sardinia, Sardis, was, mm -hmm. was located, there is um, uh, in Sardis there is a a a, a, a temple, uh, a, not a temple. I'm sorry, a synagogue. It's a Jewish synagogue, and it goes back to around 300 uh, right. BCE. And it has inscriptions on it, and then and then a few miles away in an ancient uh, town called um, I've suddenly forgotten the word. This is me at seventy five, folks. Um, <laughs> I should remember this because it it sounds like something else. The I, I'm glad I got my notes here. The the um, it's also in it's also in, in Western Turkey, and it, oh, it's called Afro yeah Aphrodisia. That's yeah, why I, 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 yeah, I, yeah. that word bothered me. Right, right, right. That, and it's it's this ruins of this this. Uh, it was it was in Turkey. It was a Greek town, but it was under Roman rule. It was when the Romans right. during the Roman Empire. Right. Between between one hundred up to about three hundred uh, A.D. later, and they they have a they have a synagogue there. They have the ruins, and there. In the ruins, they have much what we like we have in modern synagogues. They have a a subscription wall, if you will. Right, right. Where donors, they 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 a donor away. wall. Mm -hmm. It's a donor wall. I want to show you something real quickly, right? Yeah, here. this is interesting. And I think you'll find I I do think you'll find this. I I loved it. It's screen share. Now this is this is a stone, and this is an inscribed stone. It's in Greek. It's there in this this village in this synagogue of the ruins, there in this 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 ancient town mm -hmm. in western uh, Turkey, and do I want to call your attention? This is it's about it's almost ten feet tall, Rod. Wow! At the, at the bottom, it's in marble. The inscription is in marble, and it begins typically with saying why they what they're doing, and they're helping the poor, and they're feeding them, and they have a soup kitchen. And right. then it, it lists the, the donors, and, and typically it's a mixture of Greek and Jewish names, so we know it's a synagogue, of course. And it tells you, by the way, what they do, which is also very interesting. And um, it says, God help us donors to the to the kitchen. Below are listed the members and the students of the law, also known, who favorably, uh, fervently praise God, who erected for the relief of the suffering in our community. And then it names them. And it said, and one of the names, there's several, and here's Samuel, who is a proselyte. He's a convert. Yeah, convert. In, in, Jude, in Judaism, that's that's what a, a, a convert is called, a proselyte right. in, in, in Torah. Um, Shemuel, the president, uh, it has Judah, uh, uh, Josie. Um, and then it has Ammonios, a God-fearer. Mm -hmm. Now, you notice there are three distinctive types of people named on this wall. There are right. Jews, there are Greeks who are Jewish citizens or Greek by, by birth. Then you have people who are converts, and then you have people called God-fearers. Right. And they're also listed on the same inscription that I'm showing you. I got to tell you, one of the things it says, it's telling you some, what some of these people do. For instance, Joseph is a confectioner. And then uh, you have other craftsmen. Uh, Amanios is a stock feeder. 
And and down here at the bottom, I love this. This is um, Zotikos, a comedian. That's his of job course. description on this. Uh, on this of course, uh, what cynic, yeah. what what Jewish community would be a Jewish community without, without, without a comedian? A, Exactly. Without a Jewish comedian. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So right. anyway, so we have proof of, of the God fearers in, in ancient times and then even up through the Middle Ages. I'm yeah, to, uh, to look at the book, the book from the 1700s. Yeah, that this point is from, that out. This is this is in our personal because we love old books. Right. Uh, our favorite old book, old book is the Torah, by the way. So Absolutely. but anyway, this is this is a 1712 printed edition of a book called De Senatris. It's written in Latin. Mm -hmm. it, the, the author also drops into Hebrew from time to time or Arabic from time to time. And the author is uh, John Selden. John Selden is well known by anybody who knows English law. Mm -hmm. He was a polymath. He was a brilliant man. He knew several languages. And you can see he could he could really write up a storm when he wanted oh, yeah. to. The book is called De Senatris because of Selden's love of the idea of the Sanhedrin. Uh, the senators is the is the Latin word for Sanhedrin, mm -hmm. and then and then and then uh, Sanhedrin is also and the is where we get the word for the Senate. Yeah, he he wrote this extensive tome to his legal uh, his fellow legal uh, experts in his in in England in the 1600s, 1700s. Mm -hmm. Because he believed that the Sanhedrin was the basis for a wonderful court system. Yeah. And some of his ideas actually fed into common law in England. And the second part of the book is all dedicated to the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach. Interesting. The seven laws. The seven laws um, that apply to all the nations. And he is suggesting that as a, a nation, and if, you got to remember also the 1700s, pretty interesting time in England's history. Sure. Right. And turmoil. And to say that we could improve ourselves by by examining the laws that govern Israel and then to put the Sheva Mitzvot on it goes to the point that the idea has been around for a long time. Well, long I'll tell you what, when when uh, when 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 uh, Christianity began, it, it, of course, it was started by a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine. We know mm -hmm. that. What a lot of people may or may not know is that when Constantine came to power, he was uh, he was sort of a friendly dictator, mm -hmm. as friendly as you could be, a benevolent dictator. Right. But he, after a while, he changed his mind about the Jews. It happens all the time. Right. Later, during under his rule, the the Jews were forbidden to teach Torah to to non Jews on pain of death. Mm -hmm. So you can see this is when people say, "Well, why, why, why weren't the seven laws taught by the Jews?" Well, because it wasn't. This good is for the reason health. why, right? Exactly. So anyway, we have we have them showing up finally again in in a, a a time under the Roman Empire where things got friendlier a little bit later during the latter part of the Roman Empire. Then we have in in the the Middle Ages, you know, the uh, the seventeen hundreds. Sir Isaac Newton wrote about the seven laws of Noah. Right. He was a big right. fan of the Rambam. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you may may or may not know about this trunk of his belongings that the family auctioned off, and was later uh, purchased by Hebrew University. The family oh, kept really? it, they kept it for centuries in the family, and they got rid of it. and And Hebrew University won the auction, and it's full of his writings on wow. the Torah. He quoting the Rambam and Rashi, and he studied the Temple. He believed the Temple was a a template for the heavens. Mm -hmm. And he also wrote about what he called the seven universal laws. Mm -hmm. Then we come into the modern era, and we know about uh, what was the Frenchman, Pallier? Pallier, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then we have, and then here, another old book in my library. This is uh, by a rabbi who lived in Britain, and it was published in um, 1955. It's called The Universal Bible. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, Torah B'nai Noach. Teaching for the sons of Noah, and what Beautiful. what what uh, the, the, by by the way the rabbi very special guy Solomon Schoenfield he was he was in he was an army chaplain a rabbi in the army he comes from the same village of 
and I've suddenly forgotten his name. Do you remember when the Torah codes became came into? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When when everybody when when the Torah codes have been around for for centuries, right? But with the introduction of computers, they really took off. And the gentleman, uh, there, there was a gentleman whose whose name I've forgotten, and I I. I apologize, but he was the one. He was the one that was working with computers, and he literally int- reintroduced the idea of the Torah right. codes because of computers. And he's from the same village in in Eastern Europe. Oh, really? Wow. That, that Rabbi Schoenfeld is from. So it must have been a very special place. Right. And Rabbi Schoenfeld, do you know the you know the the Hertz uh, Pentateuch? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. He. Schoenfeld was married to Rabbi Hertz's daughter. Oh, wow. No, I didn't. So, so this gentleman got around, right. and he, he took all of the laws from the Torah that he believed applied to non-Jews. Now, right. I have an opinion about that idea because, because it's, a, it's, it's been um, discussed a lot since they were, you know, sages and since right. we had right. uh, the oral tradition and all that. It's even being discussed today, how much Torah can you teach a non-Jew? And I Correct. think without getting into another whole other podcast, the idea is 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 that there are there are particular requirements that, that needs to be met. In fact, in fact, that there is the the sages believe that a uh, a non Jew who who is a scoffer, who is a who is a uh, uh, you know not a you know an evil person who who seeks to turn the Torah right. laws right. against them. We have people that do that today. People Absolutely. study the Talmud, and they don't know what they're talking about Absolutely. because they're, it's because it, 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 what you're doing is you're walking into a room full of case law, right? That are full of opinions, and some people don't have an opinion. Their opinion might shock you, but it wasn't ruled as law. Correct. It, you know. So anyway, um, the point is, is that we're still talking about many of these things today, and I think that's maybe even one of the things that you wanted to broach as right. a subject is. So we're here today where there's the more the movement is growing. And by the way, you know, I told you I really recognized and identified as an Ohide in, in, in 93, mm-hmm. 94 period. And I'm a much I, 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 I've changed my mind so many times when I <laughs> when I began to be a uh, when I began to study Torah, right. I, I would not recognize the oral law. Right. And then when I learned the necessity of how it actually, in many ways, it keeps you from misinterpreting the written text. That's just one aspect. Absolutely. Of it. Absolutely. So anyway, we, like can go, what, we can go on and on about that. I, I like I, I I like to remind people, and when you see like uh, just Justice Miorcus or any of these justices sitting, and you see behind them these very uniform books, yeah. right? I'll say that's the United States Talmud. Exactly. That's the whole point. If you want to understand how to understand U.S. law, you have to know that. Yeah, and you nailed it. By the way, you just can't show up and start reading one of those books and all of a sudden you become an expert. Right. We have to rely on what the case law uh, states and how was it ruled on in the future. That is what Talmud is all about. And what's really interesting, when when you um, when you have someone that takes a hold of that, and they superimpose their religious ideas on top of it, yeah. it just becomes a mess. It just becomes a mess. And we do have what we call, uh, you know, people that are seekers and good people, messianics, mm-hmm. people that, follow, you know, that claim to be messianic Christians, you know, they follow mm-hmm. after uh, ideas that are very Jewish, but yeah. they still believe in JC. God mm-hmm. bless them. But at the same time, we are in the sec. I I see that we are in. What's the word for it? The second, the wave? the second, huh? Second wave yeah. of of the knowledge of God. The first century was the first one, and it got stomped out by Rome, and a whole religion was made out of it. Mm-hmm. There were hundreds of non-Jews being taught by Jews all yeah. through Asia Minor. I mean, right. it's evident. They were a part of Jewish uh, community in some sense. They donated to synagogues, for crying out loud. Yeah. They were a part of it. It was completely stomped out. I see right now we're in a revival of bringing back the knowledge of God to the world. And I'm really excited. I, I, yesterday I watched 
a podcast and uh what was his name um i think it's uh, let me look real quick michael Knowles. is that it yeah michael Knowles. if yeah. you're familiar with him that the name is really familiar yeah he's a, he's a commentator uh i, I don't know if his religious Oh, ideas. He's, uh, yeah, he's a, he he's a political commentator. Too, yeah, 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 yeah. He's he, by the way, he's a, he's a Christian, by the way. Okay, so he, he had a rabbi a, on. Yeah, he had a rabbi. Well, good and for I, I watched the whole episode that he played, and he was asking the right questions. Yeah, and the rabbi was helping to bring some clarity because what happens is you're sort of given these ideas in Christianity that you just assume, well, that's what Judaism teaches, or that's what Jews believe as well. And so mm -hmm. they got into the concept of Satan, and what does that mean? And is he a fallen angel, or is he an emissary of, of God? I mean, all of these things. But this is the knowledge that I do believe people are interested in. They want to know, they, they want to know the facts. Yeah. Well, you know, they, the, they wanna... I, I, I mentioned this to you, I, I think, uh, in another conversation, what uh, what I really liken, and of course, you know, the internet is full of rottenness and bad things. But, of course, you know, when when things are invented, you know, you can you can choose how to use it. But it's also full of it's full of a lot of good things. Oh, and yeah. One of the one of the good things is is that Torah is being spread like never before. Right. In fact, there was a lady uh, back back when I I. Uh, initially met uh, Ishai Fleischer, who, who used to be program director mm -hmm. at Eric Sheva in Israel. And uh, I think you had a you had a talk show on Eric Sheva for a yeah, while. Yeah, you, for yeah, for a number of years, huh? I, I was on there I was on there for right. a little I was on there for a little while. Yeah. But my 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 work and everything else and travel got in the way. And uh, but but anyway, this this lady called in who obviously loved Israel, loved Torah. Love what she was hearing on Eric Sheva. And she said that, um, she said, you know, this reminds me that she said, what's happening with the internet reminds me of Zechariah 823, which mm -hmm. is my favorite, my favorite yeah. verse, yeah. my favorite prophecy. Yeah. And that, of course, is that 10 men from every nation right. will grab the tzitzit, the corner of a, of a Jew's garment, and say, take us with you because we've heard that God. He says, I think that the internet is like that the internet oh, yes. coming from israel is like yes. those those ct those fringes right extended to the world and i think uh, that's I see a that. beautiful metaphor i see that for the way hashem is using the, the the internet this is the other aspect that i find quite interesting and a lot of people don't know this but uh there are muslims in pakistan mm -hmm. in iran in iraq that I've spoken to and helped direct and in information and give them the right information to study uh, that have fully embraced the Sheva Mitzvot as a Muslim. Sure. And, and, and actually rejected the values in Islam that is counter to the Torah. And they have to do it quite secretly, obviously, because, you know, oh, yeah. it's dangerous yeah. for them. But they're all over the world. I, I have students in Korea. In Japan, in China, in China, there's a huge Noahide movement or God fear movement. Oh, Korea, so, Korea too. Yeah, Korea. And so yeah. the children in school study passages from the Talmud. Did you know that? I, I had heard they were studying. Yeah. I didn't know they were in school. That's amazing. Yeah, in the regular yeah. at par parochial yeah. school, it's required yeah. so many hours of Talmudic study. Yeah. Now, I there's don't know a, what they're studying. I mean, right, yeah. And I think there's also a, there's a big... Uh, uh, Noahide community, I know in in the Philippines. Right. I, I also know there's a, there's a, a there was a group of about two hundred in Moscow, not in Russia. Wow, didn't know that. Yeah. Well, the, and, the, Philip, the Filipino group, which I'm connected to uh, through the Shiva, is um, it's it's massive. Like we're hun we're talking about hundreds. There there were uh, over the last five to ten years. Uh, dozens of pastors and their churches in Indonesia and in the Philippines mm -hmm. that converted their churches over to community centers for study of Noahide principles and laws. Right. Well, and, and uh, uh, my rabbi, Rabbi Richmond, he he uh, 
a while ago took a trip he and Rena Rebitson. They went. To, they were invited to come. To, they were invited to come to India. Wow! And to yeah. meet yeah. the Noahide community in India. So people often ask me, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you get the same thing, Rod. Uh, I've spoken. I've spoken in in, in schools in, in synagogues all over the U.S. and uh, the uh, I've done that under the auspices of a of a group based in Israel. Uh, it's uh, started by a, a couple of Jewish friends of mine. It's called Foundation Stone. Mm -hmm. And you can understand why I'm drawn to Foundation Stone, and I'm, right. I'm, we're good buddies now. They're 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 both of them. I love it because they're both observant Jews, and they recently got their degrees in archaeology. Oh, interesting! So it's like two more for the team. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. But yeah, they they often will they every year they would come to the states and they would put on a, a like a four or five day seminar, mm -hmm. and they would bring artifacts from Israel. Oh, yeah. And they would go to. Are schools. they still doing that? They're still doing it. They're they're. It, it's getting. They haven't done one the last year because they. Um, I, I for some reason, but maybe it was COVID kind of derailed it. I'm sure that yeah, did it. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, they we did when I was working with them, and they invited me to come along and to um, to do my lecture on the Exodus, and um, and. David Wilner, my one of the co-founders, he told me that every time that they they do these bookings, they point they say to the rabbi, "Oh, by the way, Jim is a Noahide," and he said the he said the rabbi's eyes light up and they say, "Do you think he could talk to the shul on Shabbat?" Oh, that's good. That's good. So yeah. I've been able to I've been able to to and I and I do that. I don't do the Exodus lecture. I do that All separately. Right. Uh, Basically, because it requires, you know, a projector so I can show right. images in there. But anyway, I do it on Sunday, uh, Sunday morning. Hello. Is that a Freudian slip? Hey, <laughs> yes. Don't. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm 75. I can get away. You so, can get away with Saturday it. Saturday morning, uh, they're in, in the shul. And, um, they, and, and all the friends I've made, the people that come up to me after I speak about being a Nolchide, they all ask me the same three questions. And it's probably the same three that you get. The first question they ask me is, "How many are there of you?" Right. And I tell them, and it's a, it's the truth. I don't know because because we're growing all the time. Right. And when I was when I got, when I declared I was a Noahide, uh, I think I knew maybe a hundred scattered all over the U.S. Now there are uh, there more are, than more than you can count. More than you can count, and they're right. joining, and the ranks are growing all the time. Right. And and uh, the second question they ask me is, they say, why don't you, you know, uh, why don't you organize? Why don't you have a clearinghouse where you can you can you know keep track? And I said, that's the word that we don't like is organize. Right. Because I said, you know, we're not a religion. Right. And, and even even my Jewish friends go. Really? You're not a, and, and say, no, you're, you know, the, the, the belief in God of Israel is the only right. religion, if you want to use that word. Correct. And then, and, and uh, the fact that, that, that in Judaism, they use the Torah as part of their religious understanding that, but we're not doing it for religious purposes. We're right. doing it for connection with God and yeah, because, a better understanding of the world. Yeah, and their, their Torah is their, you know, to, to invoke an age old phrase that we use in, in civics class. You know, in, in the U.S., we have separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. Israel doesn't have that. No. So no. they do. They do. They do. They have a form of now. And, and that's what's that's the pro all the problems the country yeah. has had in modern times stems exactly. from the fact that you have you have a, a huge segment that doesn't want to have anything to do with Torah. Right. That's also another discussion. But anyway, and the third the third question they usually ask me is they say. Uh, why don't you convert? Right. And I always get really glib. And I, the first time I did it, I thought I was going to hurt somebody's feelings, but they, they always laugh. I go seven, six, 13. Right. You know, like that. I, I, I still like, I still like Vindel's quote on oh. Eric Shovel. <laughs> I wasn't going to, well, there's uh, no, a couple, I'm going to say it. I can say it. There's a couple okay. of them. Go yeah, ahead. He says, uh, Ari Obermowitz, I think, I think it was Ari. Probably interviewing are. him and so I'd say, hey, you know, why, why haven't you converted? Yeah. You should convert. You sound like mom is like a real Jew. Everybody says, he says there's enough half-assed Jews in the world. You don't need another one. 
<laughs> okay. That's my favorite one. <laughs> I was that's 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 the one I tell in you know in private company, but you you've broken yeah. the rule. So that yeah, was okay. that was my favorite saying. He used to say that, and that was his way because you know this is the way Vendel was. I mean, you talk about down to earth. My goodness gracious. Right. The the man and and he was very honest in that way. He said, you know, I and this is what this is the reason that I did this kind of visual joke is right. because is because if I were to convert. I would go full blown, you know, uh, right, right. observant. I'd be an Orthodox Jew, and, and like right. I said, all of the people that I know that are no highs have converted have have become Orthodox. Right, we call Orthodox Jews. I like the word observant better, but anyway, that that's the whole point is that um, that you know they the and, and this is this was at a time when you when the other questions they would ask me they say well you know. So you're a Christian who keeps the seven? And I go, no, no, no. no, no, no. You know, so, but I, I'm getting asked that less and less. Right. When I first made my first trip to, to Israel in 1993, in the States, you could talk to a lot of, uh, I, I, I had Jewish friends in the States. They didn't know anything about the seven laws. Right, right. But the the first time I was walking down the street in Jerusalem, and I had a I had a, a day minder. Remember those? Mm, oh yeah. So I'd keep you know, and and I had taken we had we call uh, it a mobile phone now. Yeah, exactly. I had a um, we had bumper stickers that that we had that that if people wanted to put them on the bumper, it said Agudat Agudat Ben because we were we were like a congregation, if you will. Mm -hmm. I don't like that word, but anyway. Um, and the first time I was walking down, I was walking on Yalfa Street, and and I had this. I'd cut out the parts that said "Ben Enoch," and I put it on my dayminder. And this young guy walks up to me, and he says, "He says, are you Ben Noach? And I said, "Ken, Ken, yes, I am." And he was like, "Whoa, you know, right. I mean, they, they, it, every, you know, like every observant Jew I met from that time on, they, they knew it, so they, they didn't have to play catch up." And I think we. Right. I think our Jewish friends here have played catch up thanks to the rabbis. Right. So let's but, let's inform let's inform sure. uh, the listener of something very important because you you've you've said it, and that is, um, number one, but being a Ben or Bat Noach, a, a woman, a descendant of Noah, uh, is does not require you to become religious in any way. Right. Okay, that's number one. Uh, if somebody wants a community, get together with people that are in your community and share and take care of each other. We are already a community. Here's the thing. There are more Ben Noachs or Bat Noachs or Bene Noachs in the world. They don't even know it. Right. That's that's the catcher in this. They don't even know it because they have a connection with God. They love God. They study. They live a moral life, but they don't. They they've not been told that's what they are. Yeah. And so we want to encourage people. Don't think that when we say B'nai Noach, it's not some. You don't go up and sign a contract. Now they have done uh, what do you call it? The uh, oh declaration the court, or the declaration Sanhedrin. Yeah. yeah, it's a and, pledge. Yeah. yeah, a pledge. But there's no such thing in the Torah. No such no. thing. In, in fact, in fact, it is it is simply a um, what would you call it? It's a it's a simple word escaped me these days. It's it's a it's a it's a declaration. It's, it's a declaration, but it's more it's more of a um, I can't think of the word. It's a simple word. But anyway, the point is it's it it the only time the closest that we will get to signing something like that. Or anything, or even declaring it in front of a legal body, is when uh, may it comes speedily when when the Torah is is reinvited back into the government of Israel, right. and then all those all those who reject Torah and who are idolaters will have to leave Eretz Israel. If Correct. you're an idol worshiper, you'll have to leave. And the, and we have to remember those people who identify uh, with the values of Bnei Noach. Mm -hmm. And believe in the one true God, and believe the Torah was given to the Jewish people. They too can live in the land of Israel. It's just yeah. going to be a thing. All you, <laughs> but what what they're going to do is they're going to what 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 I've learned, and I I, I believe it's accurate, and it's based really on uh, other precedents in the Torah. 
for instance, we just learned the rules of war mm -hmm. in, in the previous Torah yep. Parsha. And in a when the seven tribes or nations uh, of, of the Canaanites, the collective, they, they call them, they, they had different names, but we collectively call them the Canaanite tribes. Any one of those tribes could have stayed in Israel. Absolutely. But they yes. didn't because all of them were breaking all seven and right. really, and, and, really. And it wasn't about them needing to become Jewish or become right. part of the Jewish community. It was about exactly. them doing what they were supposed to do. Exactly. And that was the same Sheva Mitzvot, the, the seven mitzvahs, mm -hmm. or the, by the time Noah came around, six mm -hmm. mitzvahs that six were. Six originally, and then seven. Six originally, and then seven at Sinai. So the, so the point is this is there are plenty of Noahides. I want to just say, for those that are listening to this and go, well, maybe I consider myself a Noahide, that's great. Uh, you don't get a, a free toaster with that. But I do know one thing when you begin to identify, with God, like an Enoch who walked with God, like a Noah who was righteous in his generation, like an Abraham, uh, when you realize these men were not Jewish, they right. were themselves, they were human. And so here's my phrase. No knock against anybody who wants to convert to Judaism, that's great. But don't be Jewish, be Jewish. <laughs> be who God yeah. created you to yeah. be. A friend of right. mine, uh, friend of mine now, said, "Yeah, he, uh, Rabbi uh, Benjamin Black, an, an old friend of mine said, he said, uh, he said, God doesn't want the world to be Jewish. He wants the world to be good and to be kind right, right, and, and right, to, right. to observe the law, the right. you know, the your the laws of your country. Correct. To treat each other. You know, I have two. I have two. Uh, I have three sons. I have, uh, one is living overseas, but the two youngest, uh, they once asked me, they said, uh, what do you believe now? Because I dragged him, you know, we were going to church before, you know. Yeah, you drugged uh, them through the mud. I took him, took him into a cult <laughs> for four years. And they said, we, yeah. don't know, we don't know what to believe now. Right, right. And I said, I said to them, I said, do you, you know the seven laws, right? You've heard me talk about them. Yeah. I said, do you feel like you're keeping them? We're trying. I said, do that and right. practice charity. Right. That's all you that's all you got to do. You 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 you'll be squared away with God. And then it's up to you if you want to take it deeper and go further in. Right. I, I, there's there's a there, there's a key word you said, charity. Uh, let me just say this. People ask also, and they may ask you, well, where do you guys go and worship? Okay, uh, worship, going to worship is a Christian thing. You go there and you worship JC or you mm -hmm. go there and worship. Uh, I, I expressed to them that there's no such thing that in Judaism or the Torah, your worship or your service to God is actually your service to others. Yes. That's all exactly. it is. That's all. If right. you want to worship, then serve others. Be kind. Uh, yeah. Be generous. Uh, give charity. Those are the highest value. Could you imagine if all of the nations would just begin to do that. What would happen? I, I, when I was when I was doing one of these talks one day, a, a lady came up to me at, at the synagogue and she said, "She said you seem to be knowledgeable about our, our Torah." She said, "Why would you, why would you settle for seven? She said. "Oh, that's I, good." And I said, "I said, ma'am, I said I appreciate the question. And let me ask you this: What do you think the world would be like right now?" If all the nations kept those seven laws, correct, then peace would break out. Correct. Yeah, and I know, and, and, I know, and it's going to happen. It's, it's going to happen. I These are that. listen. This is not an impossible thing. I think that one of the problems is that religion has all the different factions of religion has fulfilled its purpose, but we're getting to a place right now where the knowledge of God and Hashem, God Himself, is going to negate. All of those things. I think you're right, and I think I, I would tell you know if I'm uh, if we have people listening or, or viewing this uh, interview right now, and you're on the fence, or you're this, you're hearing this for the first time, and you're of a, another persuasion or whatever, mm -hmm. I can guarantee you that that when you study Torah, it will answer so many questions you've had about the nature of God and 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 how to how to be a person. But most of all, I mean. I had so many questions, and I, I know you probably did too. 
and so many of them answer. But the beauty of Torah is it that leaves you asking even more. Even more, right? Because you'll never run out of questions for Torah, right? And, and if you wanted, if you want to know uh, God and understand His essence, then it is going to be found within the words of the Torah. Bottom line. Now, look, Amen. we've been going on a long time. But I'd like to ask you, what are you working on right now? What's some exciting project you've been on? What's what anything new going on that you want to share with individuals? Well, I'm always working on trying to get a, a film here and there made. Uh, I'm, I'm working. I'm still doing research on uh, the subject of one of my other one of my other subjects. I want to I want to do a documentary about, and that is uh, Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. Yeah, the Tower. Uh, yeah, Babylon. Babylon. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, the uh, the other one is I've uh, also on, on the Megillah Esther, in the in the realm of like doing what I can as a as a Noahide, I have a I have a very good friend in Israel. Uh, he, he's uh, he made Aliyah. I don't remember. It's been about twenty years, but right after he made Aliyah, he he met. Uh, a rabbi who I think you know, Aaron Poston. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Well, Aaron we spoke spoke yeah. at our center. Well, Aaron uh, contacted me and said, "There's a guy you need to meet. His name is Yochanan. Uh, 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 that's his Hebrew name, Yochanan Castel Castellanos or Castellanos." Okay. And um, the reason he wanted me to meet him is because because Yochanan had told him about his his desire to reach out to to non Jews right and to to spread the Shabbat Mitzvot. Well, so we got together and we talked, and this was like I think like this was ten fifteen years ago, and nothing ever. We tried several things and we kept hitting a brick wall, and then life got in the way, and we we kind of like put it on a shelf and things like that. Right after. October seventh, he called me. Well, I actually I was in Israel because mm -hmm. I was there when I was there when October seventh happened. When it happened, yeah, and and I still remember waking up to the sounds of sirens. I'd never heard sirens right. in, in Jerusalem. All the times I'd visited there, I'd go there every year. Went out and I saw the Iron Dome knocking missiles out of it. Right, and that's when I found out by that time of the day that already that by the end of the day there'd been two thousand uh, rockets. Yep. Israel, two thousand or more, mind-boggling. And then, of course, we heard later on about the travesty, and I stayed there long enough to do some volunteer work. But anyway, Yochanan called me that week, and he said, "I really," he said, "You know," he said, "Did you did you hear that many of the Palestinian workers had given them maps and showed them how to get into these homes and help mm. slaughter?" Yeah. These innocent Jews, mm -hmm. and he said, "You know," he said, "that wouldn't have happened." He said, "Obviously, it wouldn't have happened if they had had if they those workers weren't even hired in the first place." Right. And he said, "You know, I think a way to stop that from happening in the future is if they if they were if they hired if the government for some under some in some method hired people who." Who said they were Noahides? Correct, a vetting system. Mm -hmm. A vetting system, and it, it's of course everybody we talked to said that's crazy. The government will never answer that. But I said, well, things are happening right now in Israel that never happened before. I, absolutely, so, Look, yeah, I, absolutely. I just got a call this week from uh, a rabbi, uh, Tzion Gigula. He is in Haifa. He mm -hmm. is a Chabadnik, and he actually has a center solely dedicated. To teaching the people, the nations who come to visit Haifa all the time, it's a tourist right, trap. Right. He says he's. You can see the beach from yeah, from right. the center, and he constantly is having groups of non-Jews coming in and teaching them and sharing this, and then they're going back home and they're sharing it with other yeah. people. And but we have you? Rabbi uh, Matthew Tresh and you uh, here in Houston that's uh, starting to do the same thing at the Chabad Center here. So. Slowly but surely, what we're going to see on uh, ramp up, and it was confirmed to me by Rabbi Gigola, uh, Gigola is uh, Chabad's getting ready to pick up the mantle. Yeah, well, what and, we're what we're doing, I mean, we actually formed a, a new organization, and it, it's called um, it's called Project Twenty Eight Hundred, and 
we have two initiatives we, we're already working on. One is that uh, we have already fashioned a out of Jerusalem stone. We have we have a proof of, of concept about this big, about the size of a tablet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's yeah. uh it's made of Jerusalem stone, and the Sheva Mitzvot are inscribed on it in Ivrit in Hebrew. Oh, that's nice. And what we what we're trying to do, our our goal is that we are we we saw that we can get them made very reasonably. We're not gonna we're not gonna sell them. We might sell them later. All but right. the idea is that every time there is a visiting dignitary from a foreign nation who comes to Eretz Israel, ah, beautiful, great idea. We're going to present them with the Shevamit's vote, and on the that's going to be made, we have it. It's made out of which it, it's inscribed incised into the stone it's beautiful on the back we'll get you know we'll have a contact that will tell us we have a, a delegation coming from mm -hmm. south south korea whatever on the back of it we will attach a translation in their language of the sheva mitzvah oh that's awesome that's great so we're we're that's a that's one that's one and the other one is we're trying to get uh, something started where the government will vet workers and if they won't use the Sheva Mitzvot, because you know, we have a government right now in Israel that, right. Anyway, you know, so it, it's probably is, no different than our government. I mean, yeah. as far as the way their philosophical yeah. views are. Now you have to ask me the uh, the obvious question, because everybody does. Why is it called the project Project Twenty Eight Hundred? Right. So, because and the reason that we call it that is because uh, I got it from Rashi. And we thought, you know, you need uh, the thing I love about a title. If it's if it's intriguing enough, it people will ask you, and you'll start right. talking. Well, so, what does twenty eight hundred mean? Twenty eight hundred people? Twenty eight hundred? Twenty eight hundred people. It means twenty eight hundred non Jews, and it comes from Zechariah eight twenty three. Mm -hmm. If you take the numbers given you there, it says ten men of every tongue and every nation. So, what? How many nations does the Torah tell us we have? So that's 70 nations. 70 nations. So you multiply the 10 men. Ah, brilliant, brilliant. Like that. And, and you I keep, wish I'd have come up with the idea. Well, anyway, so in fact, we I had one guy and said, that's a stupid name. <laughs> I said, why? He said, I doesn't mean anything when I see it. And I said, and Uber does? Uber means something to you the first time you heard it? All right. What yeah. what did Google mean to you the first time you heard it? I mean, I mean, you know, these are, you know, million and billion. Dollars. Now it's it's such a part of our vernacular. We couldn't imagine a world without the term Google. Right. But before the first time you heard it, you went, where did they get it? Google? Fact, I can't even tell you now. I can't even tell you right now where it came from. Right. So, <laughs> so we, have a, we have a website up. Uh, so we'll, put, we'll put the website. You're going to give the URL. We'll put it's right. It's on the screen right there. You'll okay. see the, the URL. What is it? Go ahead and give it to us. Uh, well, it's uh, it's it's the HTTPS, so you don't have to do the whole thing. But it's it's uh, it's low, all lowercase the numbers the twenty eight hundred project dot com, and I think you you can do, do the www, but I don't think you even have to because it's a what do you call it? The twenty eight hundred. Uh, say it again. Yeah, it's it's all lowercase the twenty eight hundred. With two, twenty, literally the numerals. The numerals, right? Yeah. The twenty eight hundred project dot com. No spaces, just all jammed together. Lower Excellent. Case. Okay. Got it. Got it. Well, I guess you. I guess you can do www. I don't. It, well, keep but, me. Uh, keep me posted. I would like to. Um, I'd like to get behind you know, it. I will. I will, and I'll keep you posted of any changes. You can. People go to the website. We have, you can ask a question and uh, we're a very small group right now. So we'll, we'll get to your questions and uh, well, thank you I so just, much for having me on. Well, well look, I, I, it's a privilege and it's new. We're doing something different. I'm not sure how to approach this. I just wanted to be conversations yeah, that sure. I'm having all the time, but nobody else is hearing. Right. I get yeah. to have these conversations like with you and Dave Donahue sitting on the couch on Chavez and you know, sharing right. archaeology stories, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wanting to start conversations to include everybody, invite them into my home, into your home to, to hear this. Now, Project 28, uh, the 2800 Project uh, is a very great, a great idea. We just launched on the Nativ site, nativeonline.org, 
uh, ask Noah. And so oh. ask, ask, yeah, ask Noah. Yeah. So all the content is, is comes from the yeshiva course that I taught on this, on the uh, Torah mitzvahs uh, for the non-Jew. Right. And so any question that they could ask is go they're going to get a kosher answer from the, I don't know, the, uh, hundreds of pages of, right. uh, of information that was in that book. And so you can just go type in the question and boom, it spits it out a kosher answer. So the way, I'm there, really excited you know, about that. And there are, on Facebook, there are a lot of Noahide groups now. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. we want to encourage people to stay in touch. If you want to get a hold of Jim Long, his email address is up there or ever how you would like to be contacted. But they can, obviously, they can write us from the, they can, there's a place you can ask questions. You write me. Yeah, just go to the 2800 Project. Right. Exactly. And and send Jim a, a a message and talk. But Jim, I hope this is not the last time we have a conversation together on I, on these. I hope not. Topics. And I I want to add one thing is that the, our our mission statement basically says a Jewish initiative for Good. B'nai Noah because it's it's based in Israel. Right. And we're we're following what the Rambam taught, which is it is incumbent upon all of Israel to teach the nations the seven laws. Yes. So it's well I I am uh I'm excited. I'm excited about the future. And next time you come across something really interesting, give me a call and say, hey Rod, let's let's have a conversation on this. Sure. A and Thank we'll you. do another one. Uh, until then guys, I just want to thank you for listening to us banter on for an hour and a half. But I just want to bring you in part of the conversation if you have questions. If there's something you want to know, make sure that you go to uh, nativeonline.org, send us a message saying, hey, heard the video, uh, the podcast, be, be interested in learning this or that or hearing from somebody about this or that. So we have some great uh, teachers, uh, some influencers, and people that you probably would not expect to come have a dialogue with us about all of these pertinent issues that's going to bring transformation to the world. I'm ready. Amen. So until then, we say shalom, shalom from you guys, and we'll see you next show. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.